I think often people think that analog equipment is prohibitive price-wise, but actually there's effects pedals out there for very cheap, as you, you guys know. So once you start interfacing them properly with your little rigs, whether it be a, uh, your sound cards or whatever, then actually you can explore much more creative opportunities than ever you can by using the same plugins that the whole world is using. Working professionally, I've noticed everyone's using the same thing. I'm mixing records for people and I'm seeing the same the same keyboard presets come in, the same bass presets come in, and I'm like, wow, you know, no one's even gone to the effort to try and find a, a signature. Like if I was a guitarist and everyone was using Fender guitars, I'd play a Gibson, because I'd be like, I don't want to use the same sound as everyone else. So the subtle combinations of, of choices is kind of what makes th those things happen. So like you pointed out, the spring reverb earlier, Mad Professor, who you guys probably know, he hates them, but I love them. So if you talk to Mad Prof about a spring reverb, he'd be like, oh, that metallic, boingy, kind of stupid sound. He's not interested. Whereas I've got like nine, ten spring reverbs, like, you know, from literally raw ones like that to big old expensive valve ones. You've got to find the sounds that stimulate you. Some of the basic principles of being creative, I think, in the studio and with audio has, has kind of drifted. When I started out in a really bad, very small radio studio in Brighton, I was basically doing the, the jingles, right? And they'd be on a Rebox machine just like that. And you had to time them at 30 seconds. And I was only 16, but I couldn't believe that no one had thought about very speeding the tape machine. And these guys were spending ages editing down little ads from 50 seconds to 35 seconds and trying to remove two bars of music to compensate. And I was like, why don't you just very speed it until it fits the time? Who cares if it pitches up a little bit, right? Because DJs pitch up music all the time. And from there on in, I was like, okay, very speed is, that's where we go to get out of trouble, right? So then from there, like I learned that tape machines could actually do more than just record. If the drummer was sloppy, I'd record the drums onto another tape machine and very speed it up, just like you do with a drum break. When you guys sample a, a James Brown break and you put it in Ableton and speed it up and it goes all fast, it sounds good, right? Well, I was doing that with two inch tape just to, because the drummers weren't that good. So I was like, I've got to speed it up to kind of iron out their, their bad groove. The effects that you can get out of it, like from a slap back or a tape echo or speeding things up and stuff, people would say to me, wow, what? What compressor were you using when you recorded those things? And I said, I didn't. We didn't really have any compressors in the studio. The ones that were there weren't very good, so I didn't bother using them. Hitting the levels hard to tape created that sound. Compression is often misunderstood in, in the sense of size of sound and what it can do for you, when actually it was the, it was the tape that was doing it. And that's because we were bouncing from tape machines to tape machines. Yeah, most of the old studios back in the day would have had two tape machines, a master and a slave. So once you'd recorded your, your stuff down on the master, depending on how you wanted to edit, I would play back what was on the master onto the slave reel and just copy track one to track one. Yeah, just like you do, imagine linking up two computers, plugging the outputs of the sound cards, the inputs of the, the next sound card and hit and play and record. So say if the, the band had played kind of a bit sloppy in the second verse, but the first verse was good. I'd rewind and I'd play the first verse in the place of the second verse, and I'd literally in sequence put the correct parts down to tape. The second tape machine actually in a way becomes like a sampler with the bad bands that I had to do that with to kind of fix. As soon as I did that and the drums went back, they sounded even better. And all I'd done was transfer them from one tape machine to the other and back again. You you've got to be careful, there's hiss and you know, all these kind of things, but bouncing brings nice things. The idea is that not to equalize the treble when it's coming off tape, because otherwise you'd be bringing up more hiss. So if you want it kind of brighter, it's better to brighten out before it hits the tape. You see what I mean? So the noise floor stays the same, but actually the sound is bright. Maybe if it's like a a folk thing or it's kind of like a pop song where you've got a lot of dynamics and it goes really quiet, then that's when you start to get caught out by the hiss. And I was very lucky, I saw the beginning of digital, that which now everyone takes for granted, like endless tracks on your computers. Like I remember when, not to sound like old, because I'm not that old, but 
like Pro Tools was like two channels and it sounded really shit. The analog masters were on half inch tape and they sounded beautiful. And just because they were scared to edit the tape, they'd transfer the music onto Pro Tools and then do the edit on Pro Tools, but then the sound suffered, right? Now the sound doesn't suffer, so that's cool. So I think you guys are actually very lucky, you know? I again had the opportunity of seeing many, many people like at work. So most of the time when someone wanted to do something what interesting, they were told no. So I always said to myself, I must never be one of the no-no guys that always say no. So like a guitarist in the band would say, oh, I read that Phil Spector did his guitar solos in the toilet or Joe Meek or whatever. Can we try the toilet in the studio? And I'd say, sure. But then the studio manager would come to me and say, what the fuck are you doing? I think in a professional environment, most people tend to record safe, which is quite boring, really. You know, you want to keep your job, but if you're doing everything really safe, then it's never really going to be like art in that respect either. Do you see what I mean? You'd kind of want it to feel special that, so that it couldn't be easily repeated. And I used to watch people record the same way, same vocal, Neumann U87 on The Voice or 414, and always SM57s on snare drums, which me and myself, I don't understand. So I would start using expensive mics on the drum kit. I would put 414s all around the toms on the snare, U67s and get shouted at. They're the valve Neumanns, I don't know if you know them. But I used to get shouted at for putting them on hi-hat mics. All these funny preconceptions, like why are you putting expensive condensers on the hi-hats. Well, why not? It's really easy to reamp stuff now. Just buy a 15-inch speaker, set it up in your spare bedroom or in your hallway. There's nothing wrong with using synths or, you know, instruments in Logic or Ableton or whatever, but send them down a guitar head or a speaker and put some, some reality into the, the sound, which is basically means space. Like when I hear like craft work or early electronic records, there's, there's a lot of ambient feeling in that. I used to fall asleep to Jean-Michel Jarre when I was a kid. But when you listen to those records, there's loads of phasing. And it's whatever phases he was using, they're just going on in the background. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, I used to listen to that go, wow, you know, space, yeah. You know, but the ambience is what's key. And that's what I find interesting about the dub. But if we think back at 60s records, they, were all, they all had a lot of ambience. If you think about the Shadows and those kind of guitars, or Dick Dale, or uh, soundtracks, I don't know, like uh, The Good and the Bad and the Ugly. When you listen to all the whistling, there's, there's a lot of reverb and delay in all those sounds. And also it's coming in and out and changing, so your ear doesn't get used to it all the time. If the same ambience setting is on from the beginning to the end, after a few seconds you just get used to it. The dub thing for me, what definitely blew my mind, was starting playing bass, and my friend telling me, hey, my mum's got these records and it's just like drums and bass, strange. I had no concept. I knew of Bob Marley and I'd heard of Burning Spear and stuff, but I hadn't actually heard a raw dub, which was just raw drum and bass with the percussion. And so I used to drive my mum crazy, you know, because obviously I was playing bass along to reggae records that are already fat. That was kind of the beginning of trying to understand as well the bottom end, because I think a lot of people struggle with bass in music. And then you find out why, and it's because they're not keeping it simple. If you keep the bass simple, and I don't mean like the bass line, but as far as the sound is concerned, yeah? Any reasonable speaker, even a small four-inch speaker, will play it back. It can be subby still, yeah? I'm looking at people that have their computer screens, and then the speaker's right in their face. And then, then I go, okay, that's why you, you're having a hard time. So even if your room is kind of small, it's not good to have the speakers right in your face. You should set them back a little bit. And if there were big speakers like Tannoy's or 15-inch speakers, I'd set them back even further. And then be like really wide apart as well, right? So it'd be three, four meters wide so that you could actually hear the, 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 the stereo information. And that's where I think the Jamaicans were very clever. So we are herbalists, I, we are herbalists, badum, badum. Like, I don't know if you know much about the history, but obviously Jamaica was a British colony, the BBC was there and all that kind of thing. So once Jamaica got its independence, the BBC and the English pretty much left and left them all that equipment, right? So the BBC in Jamaica became JBC and so on. So Federal Studios, which was one of the great reggae studios, that was an old BBC built studio and it was built to, you know, late 60s BBC spec. They had good stuff in there. It's not low budget equipment. 
A lot of people assume the Jamaicans had low budget equipment because maybe they see Lee Perry with his four track and his 70s Soundcraft mixer. But actually the traditional Jamaican studios were very, very good, right? Studio One had Ampex equipment, Ampex tape machines, the, the old ones were valve and they had the mic amps built into them. So you just plug the microphones into the tape machine, connect the output of the tape machine to the Ampex tube mixer and off you went. And that's the Studio One sound. And they're, they're awesome sounding machines, awesome sounding valve mixers with big old transformers and they sound great. Harry J had a Helios and uh, Alba Rosie got it now. So if you go to Jamaica, you can actually go and, go and check it out. Had they not pursued like the, the drive to, to be able to play records on a sound system and it sound big, I don't think they would have influenced hip hop in the same way. I don't think they even would have influenced rock in the same way as well. If you guys know Cool Herc and all the early hip hop stuff, Cool Herc's uncle was a sound system operator. In the 70s in Jamaica, they had a uh, civil war basically, if you like. So many people went to New York or London and places like that. So when I, when I moved to London at 16, I ended up working for the studio in Brixton. I see Yellow Man, Roy Shirley, Gregory Isaacs, and uh, Al Capone, and all these guys. And I'm like, what are you, what are you lot doing here? Because I thought they'd be like big, living like big superstars back in Jamaica and not understanding anything of the, the business or whatever, you know what I mean? All those guys were still making records and gigging and touring, and that's how I got to actually work with them. I'm gonna play you a couple of dubs because we're, we're gonna get into the King Tubby thing quickly. So I don't know if you guys like old soul, but when you listen to Atlantic Records of the 1950s, it's all the kind of early R&B. This is before Aretha Franklin and stuff. And the recordings are beautiful. They're really special. Now, Bunny Lee was the distributor for Atlantic in the late 60s, and he got voted best dis distributor. And as a gift, they gave him the old Atlantic recording equipment, right? The famous Atlantic engineer, Tom O'Dowd, when they were refurbishing the studios and changing it from the, the, all the 50s and 60s stuff into the new 70s, they were like, you know what, we can't throw this away, but we reckon the Jamaicans will, will appreciate it, so send it down to Bunny Lee. Bunny Lee ends up with all of Atlantic's recording equipment, not all of it, but you know, a big chunk of equipment, doesn't know what to do with it because he's just a record distributor, so he takes it to Tubby and says, Tubby, I've been given this equipment because I sold a whole heap of Atlantic records this year, set up a studio. It is the business. It's all tech, Langevin, Poltec, and all these kind of things. I know you've all heard of the politics anyway, but let's try and fire this up. So I'm gonna play the vocal version first and then we'll play the dub. Coming from the north with my face to the sun I'm quite sure I can knock you out I am the Gaga In a disyard dance I am the Gaga Yeah I am the Gaga In a disyard dance I am the Gaga oh. Well let's play the dub now Coming from the north with my face to the south I'm quite sure I can knock you out I am the Gaga I don't mess with the east or the west I leave the public to such Right, uh, apart from the ambience, but you, do you notice straight away that it's kind of louder than the first cut, right? And the bass is bigger. That's not actually Tubby changing his mix, that's the mastering engineer cutting the record. Because, because the first cut has got the vocal, obviously the mastering engineer is thinking, well, I mustn't distort the vocal. So, you know, I'm, the level's kind of safe. These are kind of like the early ones and, um, you only really hear them with the 45s, you know? Uh, so I couldn't bring a turntable and so on this time, but I recorded them in. Roots, 
at your roots Well I went to a dance down a Greenwich farm King Tubbies and the dreads was there There was dread You notice on the hi hats? Right there, that's Tubby introducing the high pass filter. Yeah? That's all it is. So you see like DJs now, because they got the high pass, low pass filters on their Pioneer things, they're doing that all day long. But these guys were doing it 30 years before anyone really kind of thought about it. See what I mean? We kind of take that for granted, right? Channel One's another famous studio. You got Studio One, which was kind of like the Motown of the 60s. And then Channel One was the 70s version of Studio One. It's a late 70s studio, but with an API console, Ampex tape machine, but it was all brand new. They re-recorded a lot of the old Studio One rhythms for themselves and their sound system. And actually, uh, Cox and Dodd, the owner of Studio One, got quite pissed off with that. It's like, stop recording my songs. So this is, so this is Channel One, right? But it's only bubbling that the young girls have plenty of. So she ran me one, you feel purple with me. Carry me one, you feel dance with me. Oh, dream me one, you feel skank with me. Show la move, body move, butterfly, not tell no lie. Hit out your arms like a two plane wing. Your chest and your bum, oh my girl, I'm just a swing. Like a plane of flying with one wing. This is one of my favorite dubs that scientists ever did, right? Hugh Mundell. Listen to how scientists mixes this. He must have been in a crazy mood that day, yeah? scientist was was mixing his effects it's not again it's not a typical thing he's he's putting EQs high pass and low pass filters before the reverb often he's, he's got a delay like a pre-delay so you'd hit the snare will hit first and then before it hits the spring the delay is adding like I don't know 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds or something just enough so that you it separates the hit between the two now a lot of pop engineers do that with lead vocals if you was to have a look at the original session file on the Pro Tools, you'll find that they'll have a really long reverb, like ridiculously long. But actually before the reverb, there'll be quite a big pre-delay. So the voice kind of sounds dry on the, uh, on the front end, if you see what I mean. But every time she sings, literally a few, whatever, 50 milliseconds later, that's when the reverb starts to, to get in, you know? And sometimes that's also a good effect to have on the drums. So you can kind of make it sound like the drums are dry, but actually in the background, you've got the sort of, you know, the noise of the reverb or the echo and things like that. 
when you're making your effects chains, I would always advise experimenting with, with a pre-delay, right? Take all the feedback off, uh, so it's not actually r repeating, it's just delaying it once, and then set it at 50 milliseconds or, and move it around. And I think you'll find you can make effects kind of sit better within the mix like that, especially when things start to go fast. Yeah, so if the snare drum, for example, I don't know, 120, 130 beats per minute, kind of fast disco beat, then those kind of things can help you create the sensation of reverb, but without making the sound sloppy in the sense of the transients hitting you, yeah? I don't I mess with the east or the west. I leave the public to such With tape machines, what a lot of people don't realize is that the different speeds have different sounds, right? Generally, the slower you go, the worse the high frequencies are in as far as response goes, and the better the bass end is. The faster it goes, it's the opposite. You get better high frequency response, but the bass end suffers a bit. Pop guys, and also I think because they wanted to make more money for Ampex, would always record at 30 inches per second, which I could never understand. We'd be burning through reels and reels and reels and reels, you know? If you get a chance to record on a two-inch tape machine, then experiment with recording it at low speeds, because it's actually much nicer. Everyone used to put the kick drum on track one on tape. So track one would be lined up to have a better bass response. You see what I mean? So they'd push it a little bit. If the, literally the desk was so bad, I'd actually go and boost the low frequency on the tape machine a bit. All right, so let's start with the spring reverb, because that's the kind of crude one for the dub. Like you can kind of see from just EQing it, you can kind of recognize. I mean, that's just a simple tone control on that. If we then put a delay before that. All right, so you can hear the, the reverbs hitting loads later, right? subtle difference but you hear the difference how it kind of moves it around and if you want to make the sound warmer I think the delay before the reverbs often do that. Do you guys ever you know, think about feeding things back on themselves or when you're doing your signal chains, obviously you, put, you, know, you put three effects together, right? And that kind of stuff. But I think what's nice about the desk when you're using analog equipment is once you kind of find the right sound and, and spot, then you can actually control it. I would set it up so that the echo right at the top of the fader starts to feed back on itself. So if it's somewhere in the middle, like that, just on the drums. And then by pulling the fader down, you just control it, right? So... After tape echoes, and they started to digitize echoes, they used these chips called uh, bucket chips. And then after that, they changed to ICs and whatever, and then essentially digital delays became like samplers. They just repeat whatever they came in. But the bucket brigade style delay, what's nice about it is that it's dull. So I think maybe uh, when you're playing a guitar through it, if it's a bright guitar, like a Telecaster or something, it just because they're a little bit duller, they sound warmer and nicer. <laughs> So you can tell straight away that's a lot duller than the previous delay that we had, right? Compared to the other delay, which was just a digital delay, when I feed that back, all the bottom end is rubbing it, yeah? I mean, 
that one is the moody one, right? So bucket brigade, the, the delays are good. Basically, just remember that you need to mess with the, the, the bottom end a little bit, right? So if the delay time, the slower the delay time, essentially the more muddy it's going to be. So in comparison, I'll show, I'll show you the take I got. On this one, I, I have actually tweaked the lineup a little bit on it anyway to, to reduce some of the bass frequencies. Basically, this is why, if possible, you should try and find a technician in your local neighborhood. Because when you do buy a tape machine, they don't always come with very speeds. So that you usually you'll find a, there'll be a connection on the back of the machine that says pitch or whatever, and it'll be a jack or an XLR or something. So then you have to go and wire up a box. It's just a resistor and a pot, yeah? So don't pay too much, because it's about four pounds worth of maplins, this is, yeah? But as soon as you do that, then you can control the speed. You can start to blow the people's minds, yeah? Because that's your job at the end of the day, is to blow people's minds, yeah? Yeah, cosmic, baby. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So that's at the slow speed. So if you're interested in using echoes as tape machines as echoes, then you, you've got to find one that runs slow at three and three quarter ips, yeah? Don't buy the next Revox. If you look at this one, you go Revox, which is a great machine. Don't buy the next model up from that, the later model, which is called a B, I think it's the B instead of the A. The A goes down, is, is the slow one, right? I got to work with people like the Far Side and stuff like that, and uh, Jay Diller and, and others, and Jay Swift too, and stuff like that. So those guys delayed everything, but things weren't being cut manually, yeah? You see what I mean? So now, like in the same thing with Recycle or something, everything gets chopped. So the delay is all coming into time. Everything's all in time, and that's actually quite boring. So I think get used to, that's why I like the, anything with a very speed that doesn't tell me what time it is and you just adjust it until you dig it. For me, it's like musicians often speed up at the end, it's natural, yeah? So I don't record with a metronome. If we start to combine filters with the echoes now, that's when the things start to get, get fun. Oh, Jimmy, won't you fist young with me? Show the move, body move, but the fly not tell the lie. All EQs mess with the face, right? Uh, even super high quality equalizers, the only ones that don't, are passive equalizers, but good and well-designed high-pass and low-pass filters mess with the phase a lot less. And digital ones are actually really good as well. So I like them, the, the, the standard Pro Tools one on the, on the standard Pro Tools plugin. I use that too, it's cool. If your phase ain't good, your music's gonna sound bad on vinyl. On CD, it doesn't matter, yeah? But on vinyl, it does matter. If your mix doesn't sound good in mono, you got a problem. I would definitely recommend, uh, as soon as possible, finding a set of speakers that you like, getting used to them, and then listening and working with them. So when you're relaxing, you're listening to your favorite albums on them, and then you get to really learn the speaker very well. If you don't do that, it's always gonna be, you're gonna be kind of second guessing. So do you guys know what a bandpass filter is? It's a combination of a high pass and low pass filter together. Once those two are together, it's called a bandpass filter. So this, just to show you, the, f the filters on this is very clean, yeah? But you can kind of hear the difference. So obviously, as we know, that's the low pass filter. So rather than EQing, if I've got a kick drum that's come from another session and it's really weak, you know, it's been recorded badly and there's not much bass, I won't actually, you know, I'll try EQing it maybe, but if that doesn't really work, what I'll do is I'll, duplicate the sound and I will send it down my filter until I bring all the sub out, just like that, yeah? And then I would mix that back into the dry signal and then that, that's how I would be controlling the sub on my 
thinly recorded kick drum, yeah? I wouldn't have the thin kick drum with loads of bass on it and, you know what I mean? So I would kind of split the two and essentially do what, you know, what a crossover does, yeah? And you'd find that sweet spot. So that's with no resonance, but as soon as we start to bring the resonance up, you know? So, you know? That's essentially kind of what Tubby was doing. He's bringing, bringing in, choosing the spots, and yeah, it's very simple. Messing around with the textures like that is really, to me, what dub is all about. I mean, just moving the, the kind of filters around just in time can be just like, you know what I mean? Subtle, but. You've got to think about the musicality of the dub. Sometimes when you start to break things down within your arrangement, that's when you start to realize you've got holes. Yeah, so I think once you get into the kind of dub side of it as well, as you start to produce the music, you start to think about what you need in the dub. So you think, actually, I need a little melody there, or the drum rolls, or see what I mean? Remember earlier we were hearing King Tubby, he was rolling every four bars. But if the musicians are being really boring and they're not putting any little phrases in every now and again, then you've got kind of nothing to latch onto. It's strange. There's good distortion, analog distortion, dirty distortion, valve distortion, and all those things. You know about all of that. That's the good side. But the bad side is things clipping. Not all mic preamps have got pads on them. If, if you've got a mic pad, a couple of those in your bag, then you'll never have a problem. In general, people record um, too close to things. So it's loud and it just kind of sounds all squashed, you know? So do you guys use ribbon mics at all? Ribbon mics tend to be expensive, but there's lots of people that are making them now cheaper. So no technical things, they not always work with the right preamp. You need a lot of gain and blah, blah, blah. But ribbon mics, I would fully explore. It's all about phase. So if you mix different types of microphones, you are a lot less likely to have phase issues. So if you're not confident about mixing microphones together, that's fine. Just don't mix two microphones of that are the same type of microphone, like two dynamics or two condensers. So have a dynamic mic in front of the speaker, the guitar amp real close, and have a ribbon mic a few feet behind, that's fine. When you mix the two, it'll be just fine. With sound, it's important to change the things at source. Oh uh, no, that guitar needs to be warmer, change the pickup, yeah? Don't think, yeah, I'll just EQ it a bit later. Don't think like that. If the drum sound is a bit weak, detune it. If the kick drum's not pushing enough bass, tune it down, yeah? Change the beater, change the heads. When you put new heads on a drum kit, the amount of bass that comes off it is mental. But 99% of the time I turn up at studios and the drum kit hasn't had a set of skins in like eight years. And then I'm hitting it and there's no bass coming off that, yeah? Old bass strings are good, but old drum heads are no good in my opinion. If, when you want to capture bass, yeah? If the guitar amp's too trebly, and you don't have an EQ, stick a pillow in front of the amp. That's what the Rolling Stones used to do. <laughs> See what I mean? 
It's like little things like that actually are, are always better than using like plug-in EQs or a cheap EQ on a, on a Mackie mixer or something. So treble reduction, you know, put a sock over the microphone. I'm not joking. We had to remaster once an old Elton John record and it'd, be done, it'd been done in the 70s with a, a soul band from Philadelphia. And it was all, all the guys that produced it were all fam famous, you know, Gamble and Huff and all these people. And when I looked at the track sheet, I looked and I saw Sock. I was like, what's that? And then when I loaded up the tape, I realized it was a room mic, but it was really dull sounding, yeah? So it was obviously the engineer had put a thick sports sock over the microphone to reduce the treble. But when I mixed that mic into the, the, the regular overheads and hi-hat and snare, boy, did it sound good. If there was one thing that you guys leave with today is trying to mess with reality, yeah? I'm a bong bong in my dog.